everyone, a warm welcome to our friends and our listeners from around the world. This is Red Ice Radio. My name is Henrik, and we are based out of uh, West Gothland, one of the old provinces in Sweden, Scandinavia. It is indeed great to be able to speak with you. And I want to uh, thank you for your interest in the kind of topics that we cover and uh, that you understand the importance of educating yourself, learning and uh, investigating on your own terms, finding out what we can and study both to become wiser so that we can make better choices, but also to sharpen our ability to see through the lies and the artificial constructs that are constantly being built up around us. Today we have for you an extended segment with uh, Karen Hudes on her website kahudes.net. We can read that she studied law at Yale Law School and economics at the University of Amsterdam. She worked in the U.S. Export-Import Bank of the U.S. from 1980 to 1985 and in the legal department of the World Bank from 1986 to 2007. After that, she established the non-governmental organization Committee of the International Law Section of the American Bar Association and the Committee on Multilateralism and the Accountability of International Organization of the American branch of the International Law Association. Now, Karen has become known as a whistleblower, and she's been outspoken about her time at the World Bank and the corruption that she saw there. She has also talked consequently on issues of economics, global policies of major organizations to the alternative media. And so these are the topics that we are going to attempt to get to the root of today and see if we can understand her work a little bit better. We'll see what you think. Karen Hudes, thank you for coming on with us. It's going to be interesting. I'm uh, eager and curious to hear more about your work. So uh, thank you for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be with you. You bet. So you were in the World Bank within uh, about about 20 years. You've been talking about the massive fraud and, and collusion within the banking system and, of course, the World Bank in specifics. Why don't we just talk a little bit about uh, you know your, your, your path, I guess, first here, kind of set the framework a little bit, what you've been... Um, through and when you decided to to speak out, uh, Karen? Yes, well, I didn't ever not speak out. It's just relatively recently that I've gotten through, uh, through the mainstream, uh, not at all through the mainstream media, through the alternative media. And that's, I think, the biggest conclusion for your listeners to take away, that there is very active censorship because the uh, issues that I'm reporting and I'm working with a group of whistleblowers inside the World Bank. And after I was fired illegally, I've been joined by whistleblowers all over the world. So we're basically a network of whistleblowers. We're all reporting the same thing. Massive, massive, massive corruption in the financial sector. Um, so <laughs> I can tell you um, when I started out, I had no idea of the depth of the um of the corruption. But what we're doing is we are uncovering the cover up. There has been a cover up of this corruption that we're talking about, and I can describe it at great length uh, to you. Um, the, the function of our whistleblowers group is just like um, in The Wizard of Oz, Toto the dog that pulls aside the curtain. Um, the whistleblowers working collectively have exposed this corruption, and what you now have is you have. Um, this secret world of corruption that didn't think it was going to be exposed, just like the wizard who kept pointing to the big projection screen, saying, don't look at what's going on behind this um, irrelevant curtain. Look up at the screen. The screen is what the mainstream media is telling people. Uh, it's all propaganda and lies. What did you do within the World Bank, Aaron, then? I was in the World Bank legal department, and so um, I was there uh, for the first 10 years. I was working as a country lawyer on various projects in the different countries I was assigned to. I started out working on Jordan and Yemen. The man who brought me into the World Bank was uh, a lawyer named Ibrahim Shihada, who before he joined the World Bank was the general counsel of OPEC. That's the organization for petroleum exporting countries. And um, after I was at the World Bank just a year, uh, an Egyptian lawyer who is now a business partner of mine um, came and asked if I wanted to meet the man who was representing the Egyptian government on the board. And I did. And I have stayed in touch with him. And I have been in touch with all of the 
board members. The World Bank was created in 1944. Um, at that time, there were 44 countries. At this point, the membership is 188 countries. And there are 25 resident executive directors who are on the board. And I have been working almost on a daily basis with the board. I have been cajoling the board members. I have met with them individually. Um, I have written to the countries many, many times. And um, the best thing about the World Bank is it is um, it's a knowledge bank, which is to say that um, there is a lot to be learned there. And the, I think the most exciting thing um, that I and the other whistleblowers have benefited from is a very accurate, it's called a power transition model. A political scientist named Yasik Kugler came to the World Bank in 2004, and he had been developing, um, a, it's a computer simulation modeling tool that predicts how coalitions will form. And um, I worked with him on a project in Ghana, but after that I asked him if he would allow me to model rule of law inside the World Bank. And he did allow me to model that. And uh, you can read the model. Um, I didn't realize at the time that Yasek had also done a model, not of the World Bank, but of the world at large. So I had, uh, but my model and his model agreed very fundamentally because the World Bank is, um, it's like a microcosm of the world. Many international organizations, you'll have the countries with one country, one vote, but the World Bank is set up differently. Um, the country's votes are weighted by the size of their economies. So the United States, which is the largest, or the, it's considered to be the biggest economy, has 16% of the votes, and then uh, the countries go on down the line. You can see on their website how, how the um, countries are weighted. And so I modeled rule of law inside the World Bank, and I didn't realize that the corruption inside the World Bank was actually caused by the corruption outside the World Bank. That's a no-brainer, but at the time, right. I, I just didn't know that we had um, a secret group of corrupt companies that thought they owned the world. And that's what we're up against. But I'm happy to tell people that all of the countries of the world have banded together, formed a coalition, and we are now taking back the world from that corrupt bunch. And who is that corrupt bunch? It's described very, very accurately by three mathematicians at the Federal Institute of Technology who modeled the um, 43,000 transnational companies on the capital markets. Uh, and what they found out was a surprise. They found out that all of the financial institutions are actually one international institution. They call it uh, a network of control. What this sneaky group did was they took the same directors and put them on the boards of all the companies. That's called interlocking directors. And so this group has grabbed secret control of the 40% um, of the net worth of all of the companies traded on the capital markets and 60% of their annual earnings. And uh, anybody can read this article. Um, the way the mathematicians describe it, they say, well, this is just an accident that happened and, and we don't think the group is necessarily doing anything bad. And then Forbes ran an article and they said um, many of the holding companies are just the big pensions and they're not taking an active collusion um, interest. But that is absolutely not the case because what this group did is they bought all of the media and they have been lying systematically to all of the people who expect when they turn on the news that they're not getting propaganda. But they are. Definitely. It's, it's, um, this is the one, uh, the, the report, the paper is called uh, The Network of Global Corporate Control. It's the one out of Switzerland, right, uh, Zurich? Yes, that's You're talking what about. I'm about. That's, That's right. It was called, uh, they did it through network topology, I believe, and they, they found uh, indeed within that a, a structure of, uh, was it 147 or so uh, companies that interlocked in this way, 
And Ed, I definitely don't want to leave that tangent. That's something we need to keep in the background here all the time as we talk more about the people and everything. But I did want to ask you a little bit more about what you believe the creation of the World Bank, uh, if, if this was created with that intention, as you said, back in 1944 at the Bretton Woods Conference, uh, you know, along with a couple of other institutions at the same time, you know, the IMF uh, among some of the other ones. But it was the founders were John Maynard Keynes. Uh, he was a member of the Fabian Society for a short while. You had uh, Harry Dexter White and all that. And officially, the World Bank was, you know, was formed as an international financial institution that was going to provide loans to developing countries. But do you think that it was founded on those principles or was the corruption systemic from from day one within this organization? What do you think? Uh, It's not an easy answer um, because the main thing that the World Bank was created to do on the face of it and what many of the countries believe, don't forget the countries went and signed treaties. So it has a, a, a structure that we can take back. It was hijacked. There, there are layers within layers. And I, after I was fired, I found out that one of the main functions of the World Bank and the IMF, you know, these two organizations are really, for all practical purposes, just one organization. Right. They're across the street from each other, and there's a board of governors, which is the ministers of finance of all the member countries. And those ministers of finance gather together um, twice a year, plus there's um, a group of 25 ministers of finance that meet and consult with each other on an ongoing basis. And so um, the answer is that, yes, there was always a secret hidden agenda, but at the same time, it is a convening party. And it is um, a, a structure that the people of of Uh, the earth who want to clean up this corruption in the financial system. And it is a matter of whether or not we're going to continue with Western civilization. We're on the edge. And I can also tell you that this um, stakeholder model I was uh, describing, this uh, power transition model, it's 90 to 95% accurate. And when Elaine Colville, who is a Scottish whistleblower from the World Bank, and I got our statements up on the UK Parliament, and, you know, I'll be happy to, to give your listeners links so you can see what we were reporting to the UK Parliament. Once that happened, the model started predicting that we in the humanity would use the World Bank structure and the IMF structure to eradicate this corruption. It provides a legal basis and the laws that I was using, because when I started out, I didn't, I just, I was just doing what a lawyer inside an entity that issues bonds on the capital markets, because that's what the World Bank does. It issues $180 billion worth of bonds all over the place, denominated in all the currencies of the world. It takes the money from the people who buy those bonds and it trades on the on the capital markets, earns money. That's how the World Bank finances its budget. So I was trying to correct the financial information. That was my job as a lawyer inside the World Bank legal department. And and the laws for financial disclosure are cut and dry. They're very clear. And so I have used that, those laws, as a scaffolding to clean up the corruption that we're going to be describing. So um, that's that's one of the hardest uh, jobs that I have when I'm talking to people on the radio. They think I'm a whistleblower like, you know, Snowden or anybody else. But I'm actually not a whistleblower. I'm a sting operation. Explain that a little bit. Me and the World Bank whistleblowers are a sting operation. And we are enforcing the securities laws because when there's a cover-up and the financial statements are inaccurate, the people who own this institution have got to do something. And so yeah. I have been going to all of the governments of the world, including in the United States, I've been going to all of the state governments because they are obligated to protect the people that live in their state. So I'm not just working on the federal level in the United States, and I'm not just working in the United States, I'm working in all of the countries and all of the securities entities at the same time. Now, let's clarify a little bit more here in terms of you, you mentioned that already a little bit in terms of how they, well, create money or, or, or make money as well uh, with the, the issuing of bonds and everything else. But 
in terms of I, IMF and getting loans from IMF as a developing country, you also have to pay a member's fee to even be part of IMF, correct? So there is a, a system here that when you need to be dependent on loans by other people, you need to enter into this organization, which in most cases isn't really at that stage maybe voluntary. It's what you see as the only w- way out. And then, of course, the World Bank and the IMF puts pressures on those countries to have them reform certain things and do certain things. So it's a way to kind of grab control over a country, um, more or less in a way that haven't been thought about before, kind of overriding the political system and everything else. Would that would you say that that's a correct assessment? I would say that that is a superficial assessment. Let me tell you the real assessment. There is more wealth in the world than people know about. And when the World Bank and the IMF were created, they were given a role in that wealth as supervising that wealth. And we're using that role to take back our world and our wealth. And we're going to prevent all of the currencies of the world that are about to crash deliberately, deliberately. There is this group that um, has the network of control that you see on the capital markets. Think of an onion and, you know, I've been going with the rest of the whistleblowers. We've been getting to the core of this onion. This group has not had some, um, has it's had its own ideas about what was supposed to happen. But as the coalition began to coalesce, things started happening differently from what that group is used to. So when uh, Yasek Kugler, who's the political scientist, who came to me in 2004 with the, the power transition model, he said, Karen, we have five years to prevent nuclear war in the Middle East. That was Syria. The UK Parliament refused to um, engage in that supposed war. This is the first time that we have rejected a banker's war. So you you can start to see how this coalition is working. Um, I'll also tell you about another thing that was supposed to happen that did not happen. And that is on the 8th of October, there was supposed to be a nuclear device detonated on Charleston, so there would be massive panic, and the bankers could grab control. That didn't happen either, because the three military entities that are the strongest, the Chinese, the United States, and the Russians, understand the coalition. Don't forget, I have been writing to all of these countries on a, you know, (laughs) in in some cases, it's a daily basis. And they know of of the existence of this coalition. I've been on Russia television today three times. Yeah. And, you know, I'm starting to get through to the the people who, who can understand what it is that's happening behind the scenes. But I have been writing to the attorneys general in the, in the United States for three years. And if you go to my website, you can see the correspondence. And I have been telling them about the formation of the coalitions, what to watch out for. Um, one of the things that happened um, that the when I first started working on this problem, I thought it was just simply the job of an in-house lawyer, although I knew that the World Bank was a special place. But I didn't I had no clue that we had massive financial corruption. You know, that was not the world that I understood. I, I, I accepted what was um, on the face of what the mainstream media was telling us. That's why when I started having problems, I went back to the mainstream media um, for the first five years. I was fired in 2007, and it was only in um, 2013 that I started getting um, more exposure on the alternative media, that I understood that it was a total waste of time to try to get something published when this network of control had cleverly set up a screen of disinformation. And they would and and, you know, it's only relatively recently that I found out about all of this gold and the function of the IMF and the World Bank in making sure that this gold is not stolen. And there have been a lot of attempts to steal the gold and a lot of bribes. And that hasn't worked, has it? Now, I want to talk more about that. There's many components to what you just mentioned that we need to kind of discuss in more detail. But let's back up a little bit here. 
Uh, and I want to ask you about the coalition more. I've heard a couple of interviews with you previously, but I haven't heard much about who is in, coal in the coalition, you know, and what principles, I guess, it's, it's run on or how it's run. It is very, very loose. And I think if you were to, um, I think the best way to understand it is to, um, well, I can give you one example. Um, there is now a fourth credit rating agency that's owned by the Russian and Chinese. And that is serving as a very strong incentive to get rid of this corruption because the U.S. credit rating has now been downgraded by the Chinese. It started out being downgraded by Standard & Poor, and then the Attorney General in the United States, Eric Holder, sued Standard & Poor. But I, I started writing the credit rating agencies when a U.K. lawyer advised me to do this. Um, I had gone to the UK Parliament and I guess this lawyer felt that it wasn't fair for the UK to have to shoulder the whole burden. And when I say the UK, it's, you know, these countries are not monolithic. There are forces that are fighting the corruption and there are forces that have been totally co-opted and they're, the way they act is treasonous to the interests of the people in those countries. And, you, you know, you can rank the countries in degree of the um, control that, that they're under or the degree of freedom that they have. But um, th this, the group, I, I'll, you know, I'll tell you who, who the group is that's behind that network of control. It's the Jesuits. And there's also some groups behind them, but we're still working among the coalition to understand precisely who those, those groups are. And if I, if I get out and start telling you, you won't listen to the rest of it. People are advising me not to speak about who's behind the Jesuits. Why not? No, no, I, th I think you should definitely. I mean, here's the opportunity to really get to the core of it. So why not? Give us a little tidbit. Okay, then let me tell you um, what I heard. I'll quote, I'll quote the person who um, gave me that information, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you how we're trying to verify it. Okay? All right. Um, this is a neurologist who, by the way, um, noticed that, Somebody who was who had the same theory, uh, and I, I wish I could remember his name. But anyway, um, he died a sudden death at the age of 34. What is the theory? If you look at the uh, picture of um, Akhenaten and his uh, daughters, the pharaohs, they had these huge headdresses. That was to hide their large skulls. They're hominids. They're not human beings. They're very very smart. They're not creative, they're mathematical. And they they had a much stronger force in the um, earlier Ice Age. And um, one of the things that, um, that this scientist, his name is Edward Spencer, is talking about, you know, there are a lot of museums that have skulls of these, um, uh, some people call them coneheads by slang. Some people say it's more than one species. Um, it's pretty clear that that group um, is not able to, um, the off, they, they may produce offspring in, in mating with female humans, but that offspring is not fertile, or we would see more of these, um, these hominids. And, uh, and they have been, um, you know, making themselves scarce, but uh, when, when Edward was giving me all this information, I shared it with a man in Portugal who um, went and had a meeting with a bank, and he sent us uh, an email the next day and said that there was a, a, um, a big skull person with bright blue eyes at the meeting of that bank. The, the, this person, um, uh, the bank had made some improper loans to his father. And so he was meeting with a bank about those improper loans. And, you know, he said, he said, did I think that um, our emails had been read and, and were these um, hominids deliberately showing themselves to us now? Um, there's another person who said she saw some of them running around in Egypt. But if you look at the um, statues, you see all these big headdresses. And then there are some other times when people show up with, with these uh, improbable headdresses. And you also see them in the Vatican, by the way. Those those crazy um, uh, I forget what you call them that that the people in the Vatican wear. 
that that would also um, hide those big skulls. Well, interesting. That takes things in a bit of a different direction. So you're basically saying that these uh, um, beings, whatever they really are then, maybe not human hominides, we, we've talked about elongated skulls and other uh, oddities before on the program, so we, we're familiar with it in that reg- regard. But uh, you're basically saying that that's the, the power behind the throne in this case. Yes, and when people talk about extraterrestrials, that's um, that started happening when there was a technology developed to um, make suggestions inside people's brains. So people who thought that they were being abducted, something happened to them, but the experiences that they felt as being real were things that were, uh, that they didn't actually experience, but that, that that technology was able to suggest to them so that they, they had vivid memories of things that never actually happened. That technology exists. It's very secret. It's called MK Ultra. Sure, sure, definitely. So, do you uh, do you personally believe this? Have you have you been able to verify any of this yourself yet, or seen any of this? I think it's probably more likely than all of this extraterrestrial garbage that we're being told. All right. Well, that's very interesting. I uh, th- that that takes things, as I said, in a bit of a different direction. We could. Let's keep that uh, on the back burner a little bit because but, I do want to return to that. Answer your question uh, okay. a little more um, clearly, Henrik. Okay. Yep. Um, I am not categorical about any of this. Um, one of the characteristics I have is, there's a there's a trait called uncertainty avoidance, which is that you you're not comfortable with ambiguity. You want things to be resolved. I'm just the opposite. I don't. I, I never going to close the door if there's new evidence. I right. never jump to conclusions. Yeah. So this is at this point um, a hypothesis which seems to me more likely than not, but there's a whole group of us that's trying to come to grips with this because what you have is a world in which there are secret societies and secrets and the news and the information that ought to be public is not public. So one of the most important um uh, points that uh, a monetary economist that I just spoke to made about history. Um, this is Antal Fekete. He's a Hungarian monetary economist who specializes in currency. And his point was that there was a dark ages that happened around the 400s when civilization went into arrest. And he said, we are replicating that situation. And the point I made to him was that actually we were not replicating that situation. There was a a danger that that could happen, but that our situation was very different because we now have an internet and we now have exposed these, this group that is behind the scenes and pulling the strings. It wants to remain unknown and hidden, and it's anything but hidden. Definitely. Now, let's let's try to clear something else up here, and I think it's a really important point, and I'll see if I can formulate this in a good way. But things today are horrible. They're, they are, in fact, so horrible that people are willing to take basically M, any remedy to cure this disease that we see of, of corruption and everything else. And then weaved into this, we have something completely different, which is about the reformation, not only of our economic system, but also of the political system, uh, the power hierarchy and everything else. And there are sometimes people as well so, or, that, are, that are so upset and, and frankly hateful of the system that is in place that they're willing to look anywhere else to get, to get rid of it. And although that can be a good energy of sorts to ride on, there is also at the same time a very profound danger that the very same elements that have been controlling the world in this way with the corrupt system with the monetary system and everything else that that have pushed us to this edge so far that we are ready for the reformation that they are behind what i'm what i'm getting to here here is that the people who are in charge that i believe are behind the, the 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 global conspiracy wouldn't ease up so easily they would definitely want to be there and try to control the 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 game until the last drop that they have and i've for a long time been suspicious of the fact that 
when we're asked to reform the system, people are very willing and eager to do this without really thinking, okay, who is behind the reformation? What, where are these, where are the ideas coming from? It's like the cl classic, you know, problem reaction solution. And I see the same thing with the economic situation that we've been in now in the last few years, that it seems to me when I start looking at the people who have been in charge of the system, in charge of the uh, economic, you know, chairs that have majority of the power, that the, the, the crash has been intentional to, to uh, you know, coalesce power into fewer hands, to uh, centralize these systems even more. So at, at the end of it, I come out through the other side of this and I look at it again and I'm asking, who are, who are asking us to reform the system in this day and age? And as you said yourself, since you're part of a sting operation, how do we know that what you and your coalition are asking for is not part of that very same system to reform it into something that might even be worse, if you see what I'm getting at? I'm try not trying to yeah. look down on you, of course, but this no, is a no. valid question, I think. I think it's very important for people to kick the tires and, and get clear answers. And you should never take anything at at face value because just imagine how we whistleblowers are functioning other whistleblowers come to us and we have to vet them to find out what you know what are they doing are they helping us are they there to derail us so so we you know um i have nothing but respect and um uh i'm the hardest the hardest questions are the ones i welcome the most because I have the answers. And so um, what, what, I, what I would say, um, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to, to go into this question at great depth because, you know, I've, every time I make a statement now, somebody comes after me and says, I'm a shell. I'm, you know, first of all, I'm, I've gotten so much publicity that how could I have gotten this publicity unless I were a disinformation agent? But the answer to that is I have won this publicity. Um, through a lot of effort and you know you can see the trajectory of of each thing and and for example when uh, reddit um, put one article on me they refused to allow me to answer any of the um, the questions that came up because reddit which had been started by Schwartz who was of course su he committed suicide just as he had won um, anyway um, Reddit was bought by Condé Nast, which is part of this information, um, uh, disinformation um, group. So, you know, um, I think the easiest way to show people how the World Bank whistleblowers and me as part of that group has been moving through these, you know, through this um, corruption is to go and look at the chronology, which is when I started, uh, you know, in opposition to this to this um, corruption and you can just see how the battle went forward and I can you know at some point I'm gonna write a book and I can say what it was that I understood at each level because I had no clue that things were as deep and the, and that the you know these secret societies were there I mean I had I had certain ideas that there were problems so for example um, the longest serving general counsel at the World Bank was a Dutch lawyer named Aaron Brachus. Um, one of the things about me is that I'm American, but I speak Dutch, and I studied economics at the University of Amsterdam. This happened because uh, the Vietnam War was going on just as I graduated from college. And, you know, I went to Woodstock, for example. Um, and so when they said, uh, love it or leave it, I said, I, I think you're, you're, you're making a good point. And so I went and studied studied economics in Holland. But anyway, so I, sp I speak Dutch, and this Dutch lawyer um, told me, he gave me the operation manual to the World Bank. He was the longest serving general counsel, and he told me that in 1968, when Robert McNamara became the president of the World Bank, when you have somebody from the Pentagon to come in to run the World Bank, that's when it gets extremely corrupt. So when Paul Wolfowitz came to the World Bank, and I was, you know, inside the World Bank, um, I started, you know, I was, um, by that time, I was senior enough that I understood some of what was going on internally, and I had some allies internally. So um, the man who was representing the Dutch government at the time and I went to see Jim Wolfenson to, to find out what was going on with this corruption. At that point, we were just talking about the financial corruption at the World Bank. And um, so... 
I guess the best way to to also to understand um, about whether I'm part of the solution or part of the problem in the World Bank when there's a project you have to um, at the very beginning of the project you have to try to formulate in your mind what it is that you would you would be looking for to know whether the project is succeeding or failing and so I would tell um, people who are looking to see how the World Bank whistleblowers are working I would say um, one of the indicators is to see what's happening to whistleblowers and especially the World Bank whistleblowers if something happens to them then it's pretty clear that the rest of the entity that's going on is just bad and there's no hope for it I've spoken to the World Bank whistleblowers I said if we if we went back inside the World Bank do you think we could make a difference or do you think we would just be there as window dressing mm -hmm. and they all said no we can we can take it back we can take it over and I guess at this point now that the world is on the precipice of a crash of the paper currencies there's a very clear way for the world to know whether this is helping or hurting the World Bank and the IMF are the ones that have the keys to the world's gold they're at the very center of the international financial system so if that gold is coming out to the individual countries for the people in the country to manage for themselves then the, the World Bank is part of the solution otherwise it's not so that's kind of what you're seeking to do at this stage is it's still to use the infrastructure of the World Bank that's there but simply reforming it I guess from the inside with the with pushing the wrong people out of place and putting no the, no? no okay clear no. clarify that for us the World Bank owns possesses is the responsible agent for releasing the world's gold you can't get around it you can't say, oh, let's just, you know, ignore it and start from scratch. It's got a function. Nobody knew about it, but that is its function. And we need desperately to have the world's wealth come out of hiding. It's, in, it's cloaked in secrecy. Now, there's um, a banker lawyer named Wolfgang Strzok in the Philippines who has all of the documentation. for. They're called the Global Collateral Accounts. And I have put a lot of his documents up on YouTube um, together with my interview with Antal Fekete. You know, I just put it up there. And what I said at the end of that interview was I said, the world's people and governments together have got to keep asking questions about the accuracy of these, um, these documents. They can't just let the World Bank and the banks of the world keep our gold in hiding because we're about to go into the dark ages. So they have got, you know, it's like um, I've been weaving a web together with the other or shining light on this, this hidden function of the World Bank. And now it's going to be um, brought out into the world, um, into the world for us all to deal with it. That's what it is. It's kind of amazement. We have shined a light on it. Explain that mechanism a little bit too, Morris, and, and how you would see this I mean, would this be, uh, <laughs> would the gold be divvied up among the nations or how, how would yes. this occur? Yeah. Yes, yes. It would back their currencies. Well, this is what I'm saying now. Obviously, everybody has got to agree. But we are, there, you know, if you look at this um, YouTube video, gold is about to go into hiding where you will not be able to get it. And if that happens, then you have no way of financing international trade and the whole international economic system um, just collapses. We can't have that. And we have a limited period of time before that happens. It, and it's, you know, and so what I, what, what Antal proposes is to um, mint the gold and to use those coins. Uh, and, and, you know, there's silver and, you know, there's, there's artwork, there's treasure, there's gems. It's, it's all of the world's wealth has been put in this collateral account which the World Bank and IMF executive, um, you know, the board of executive directors and the um, board of governors, that's the ministers of finance, they're the ones who, who are responsible for supervising this collateral account. 
it goes right through that organization. And it belongs, the beneficiaries of the, of the global collateral account is humanity. So we, we have to keep our ministers of finance accountable. And we have to take this gold. Now, it takes a while to mint this, um, these precious metals. So what Antal was suggesting is that we give certificates of the gold to use and that we, we use that as currency instead of the fiat currencies. That's mm -hmm. just, you know, the paper currencies, which aren't backed by anything. They're backed by debt and they're about to crash. What happened during the with the implementation of the Bretton Woods system, which is part of this, of course, that gold was taken out as the reserve currency. The U.S. dollar was put in its place. So, again, to clarify this a little bit more, you're saying that the gold has been basically amassed in in one in one not place perhaps, but in in one uh, I guess account that you call it uh, for for the purposes of what exactly? Just to take it out of circulation first to amass it, and and then so that it later could be divvy it up like what you, what you're saying here so the the world would be the beneficiaries of this account or no they were not benevolent yeah no i understand that but are you saying then that the point the point of the of the bretton woods <laughs> system to to attract the you know to take to take gold out of circulation was for their point of view to to try to get their hands on all the gold is that correct the that group that i was telling you about the jesuits and behind them this uh, this um a uh, group called uh, Capensis, Homo Capensis, um, or Coneheads, as some people call them, they were they were trying to steal the world's gold. But Marcos, Ferdinand Marcos, who whose job it was to be the trustee, what he did, very clever man, was he took the gold, shipped it off to Singapore, you know, because the gold was in accounts that that these crooks knew about, shipped it off to Singapore, and then. He deposited it in different accounts with different passwords that Wolfgang Strzok has all the paperwork for, and these crooks do not. And it's for the benefit of humanity. So it goes back to uh, Yamashita's gold, this whole story. No. it Yes, that's part of it. It starts off with Solomon, and then you get the Aztecs and the Incas and the Pharaoh's gold, and you you, you then get all of the gold that Yamashita had, it's more gold than you know about. It's, it, the, wor the world is incredibly wealthy, and we are all going to benefit from it, and we're going to have to learn how to uh, manage it. We're not going to get it right in the beginning, but the one thing is we are certainly going to do it transparently. Okay, I'm sorry to, to hammer this point over again, but I, there's something I'm missing here because I guess what I'm asking is how did we go from this 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 suggestion of of this implementation of a system from being a conspiracy by you know wicked men and and people who wanted to take advantage of this over to a situation now where this is something that's going to benefit people? What what happened along the way here? I'm not following that, so maybe we can clarify that a little bit. Okay, what happened is the whistleblowers found out about their plans, and we think about fencing. I'm a fencer. Somebody comes at you, you parry repost. So you take their attack and you use it against them. They created that system in order to steal the gold. Ferdinand Marcos found out about it and turned it around. And all of the World Bank whistleblowers, together with, um, with Wolfgang Strzok, we are, we're using it now. We, we, you know, they didn't think we were going to find out about it. And, and. But how did you guys get, con gain control of it? How did you gain control of the situation? Well, this is a mystery how Wolfgang found me and I found him and each individual World Bank whistleblower. We have been kicking the soccer ball up and down the court now for about five years. How, how we managed to do all this in this world is, is a huge mystery. But, you know, we, we will tell the story. Is it a mystery even to yourselves? Yes. Okay. Well, there the has, has to be there has to be something there. There has to be a, a a point in here where where the ship turns around and someone did something to gain the upper. I mean, otherwise, yeah. I guess from my so perspective, it would be that someone would just basically would would guard the accounts that would make make sure that this wouldn't be ending up in someone else's hands, right? So tell we us didn't more about know it. anything about this when we started but what we did know is we had this very accurate power transition model that told us that we could form coalitions and take 
get rule of law at the World Bank. So we always knew it was feasible. And we also found out that we were winning in 2010, which is when the, the UK Parliament started publishing our statements about the corruption. In other words, th this was, um, you know, this was a, this was a turning point. So, and we have just been um, consolidating this this coalition. But for example, um, I would be sitting at home. I, I live out on the border of, of uh, Washington D.C. And the Indian whistleblower would call me up and say, "There's a meeting of a committee in Congress um, in the next hour," and I would just jump in my car and get there and show up at the meeting. Um, and, and it was an important meeting. So, for example, one of um, three senators, Senators Luger, Leahy, and Bai, required the U.S. Government Accountability Office to do an um, to look into the corruption that we had been reporting. And then the World Bank refused to allow GAO to do this. So this was, you know, this was giving us a, a handle. We we had toeholds all along, but it was, you know. It was um, a rather um, iffy kind of a proposition that just a handful of whistleblowers could take on this massive a corruption. But we managed because we were being helped by the countries as well. And and uh, so power transition model, you're talking about something that was run basically as a simulation within something else. And then it you're saying that it gives you feedback and then they it the, the model told you that you're you're gaining the upper hand all of a sudden what, i mean what happened along the way here uh, to, to, okay. to turn that so, around so the, the, the very first thing you'll see the thing that i modeled and it was an imperfect model because i didn't understand that the media was part of the problem i thought that the media would be part of the solution so i gave that a positive function although it's actually one of the biggest parts of the problem but anyway, um, the rest of the um, of the see the way the model works is you look at three different um, things. You look at who are the stakeholders, who are the groups that influence the problem. You try to figure out where they stand on the issue. You try to figure out how powerful they are, and you try to figure out how important that issue is to them. So, for example, the president of the United States is important, but he's got a lot on his plate. The staff association isn't as important. But rule of law at the World Bank is their number one only issue. So you, you try to give that a numeric value as well. And then the model um, crunches these numbers. Um, I, I took uh, Yasek Kugler with me to Ghana. We were working on um, a freedom of information law in Ghana. This was a project that was being financed by the Germans. And we were trying to figure out why it was that Ghana was not passing this law. And so I found a man who was very familiar with who all the players were in Ghana. And he gave us numbers. And at the end of the um, exercise, we found out the reason that Ghana was not passing this law was because the Germans were insisting on a perfect law and there was not sufficient support. They had to, um, they had to be able to accept an imperfect law. And that's what happened. And then we brought this man to, um, to the World Bank, the one who had given us all the numbers, and asked him what he thought about this um, power transition model. And he said, well, you know, the numbers are so inexact that it's really a useless program. He was the one who gave us, who generated the numbers. I mean, it was, it was kind of funny, actually. It's kind of ironic. But anyway, um, this model predicted in 2004 that if the United States, inside the World Bank, if the United States did not play by the rules, that it was going to lose the ability, there's something called the Gentleman's Agreement, that the World Bank would always handpick the president of the World Bank and the Europeans would always handpick the uh, managing director of the IMF. That was a compromise that was worked out. And this model started predicting that the United States would lose the Gentleman's Agreement. And I, I told the Congress that this was going to happen, and that's exactly what happened in 2010. And now... Um, although there's still a president of the World Bank, he had to run against two other candidates. All right, let, let's talk a little bit more about the, 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 the model here and the program done here, because obviously any model that doesn't have all the variables of, of, of reality is going to remain a model, it's going to be separate from the, from the real world, and that's a very, very difficult thing to, to, to do. So who wrote the program and on what computer did or does it run? 
Well, if you look at the article um, that Lars Schall wrote, there is um, an evaluation of the power of this kind of model. They they've they have a experience with this model in the Department of Defense, um, and the model is 90 to 95 percent accurate. And you can read the literature on this model. It's using game theory. And game theory, there, okay. And whenever there's a disagreement between um, the experts, you know, the, the analysts, and the model, the model wins. And, I, you know, I've been living the model. In the beginning, I had no idea what this model meant. Um, I thought, oh, you just sort of sit back and watch it happen. And then I realized afterwards, no, we in in acting in – giving information we're the ones that are driving this this model and and um when did that dawn on you guys or or you <laughs> slowly <laughs> it was too much to bear all right now tell us a little bit more about who lars uh, Schall is then and, and how he uh, plays into the picture i don't think our audience have heard about him or who he is okay lars Schall is a, a fantastic um journalist um, by the way, one of the, the, the privileges of being involved in this saga is getting to know the, the actors in this saga. They, they are just the most incredible people that you ever want to meet. Um, and Lars is, is way up there. He's, you know, I've been uh, for years trying to get somebody to cover the story. And then when Lars started covering my story, I, I thought I had gone to heaven. And this article that, that you know, you can read that it has remained the single best article. Um, you know, he his questions drill right down, and he, he covers the whole thing. Um, and you should see some of the other articles that he's written. But anyway, so that's who Lars is. He's um, a journalist who um, most of what he publishes goes on, I think, the Asia Times. Um, but it was interesting because Asia Times refused to run the article that he wrote on me, and then he just put it up on his website. So to get a little bit closer to to the question regarding uh, you know if this is something that's going to you know aid or 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 you know drag us further down the control mechanism, I guess that the the truth regarding this fact would be in the pudding, as they say. So so what are the the coalition seeking to do, and how would you want to see the economic system being being reformed? What are some of the changes that we need to put in place for us to get out of the situation? Uh, well, first of all. Um uh, let me explain to you my um, role now vis-a-vis -vis the World Bank, because I bought a World Bank bond and I sued the World Bank. The World Bank had no immunity because I was a World Bank bondholder entitled to accurate financial information. Uh, other employees that get fired have nowhere to go because the World Bank has immunity. But the fact that I am also a bondholder meant that I was not you know, I could I could hold the World Bank and all of the ministers of finance to account because the World Bank is required to give accurate financial information. Now, what is it that I want to see? I'll tell you what I said to um, the person who represents the Russian government in 2009, because one of the uh, hidden rules in the World Bank is that the president of the World Bank will propose whatever happens. And the board will vote up or down whatever the president proposes. Now, that's corrupt. When you've got the World Bank being managed secretly, you can't, as a board, abdicate your role. And the articles of the World Bank say that there's an active role for the board. So I went to um, the, the Russian government. You know, I would, I would meet with them. And I said, this, this rule that the um, president will only – have the be the only entity that has the right to propose things and the board votes it up and down. This wasn't written in the rules. This was just um, a convention. You know, there was a memo that said this is how they were going to function. I said, you just have to write a memo saying it doesn't function that way anymore. And I wrote the memo. And then I couldn't go back inside the World Bank. Um, and that was the fact that they locked me out meant that I had a cause of action because under the law, you have only a limited period of time to react when, when there's an action. And so I had been fired in 2007, and then I met in 2009. So that meant that I had three months after that I was locked out of the World Bank to bring a lawsuit. And I mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Anyway, um, how, how so, did that go? By the way, is that is that settled or what happened there with that? Ah, it is settled, but the um, I <laughs> l- let me just finish um the conversation sure, that I sure. had with um with the Russian uh, representative. I said I just want to make sure that the board is the one taking the decisions now, and so make me acting general counsel of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and. The minute I do anything other than empower the board, you can just throw me out. I said, that's what I want. And after that, I was locked out of the World Bank. And um, so my lawsuit, um, I, I mean, I can I can go on and on. I can regale you. But um, let's, do you remember Dominique Strauss-Kahn? The yeah, one I was, who, I was actually yeah. going to ask you about what, what happened with him. Was he, yeah. uh, you know, put in, put, in, uh, put in his place by someone else who wanted to see him uh, go down? Or what happened there? He was interested in the gold and what was going on with the gold and getting it to the world. He was doing his job as managing director of the IMF. That's why they got rid of him. I see. But but he, you know, it wasn't um, it wasn't all sweetness and and light. So he he put a French woman into the job of general counsel at the World Bank, um, misusing some information I had given him, and. Um, I didn't like that. And she was the one who was suing me. So you can imagine how mad I was. You know, I go to him and ask, solve his problem and ask him to solve my problem. And instead, he hires somebody who who um, is suing me. So that's what I wrote in a magazine. I said, this lady should not be managing a lawsuit. It should be handled by the board. And the day after that, the three judges, those are the same judges that said that there should be... Um, you know, the prisoners in Guantanamo Bay were not entitled to um, habeas corpus to 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 get out of jail, that they could be locked up indefinitely. So this was this was a handpicked group of judges. And what the judges did was they gave a, a defective opinion. They said, we're just going to agree with what the lower court said. And they they were not allowed to do that because whenever a case is being dismissed early on, the, the appeal has got to completely ignore the lower court. And then they said, if I tried to appeal this, they were going to um, assess, I would have to pay the legal fees. And I was not just suing the World Bank, I was also suing the audit firm, KPMG, because I went to KPMG and I said, you, there's a cover up here and the Government Accountability Office audit is being ignored and um, I'm being ignored and they wouldn't let me talk to the audit team. And when there's an audit of the internal controls, you're not allowed to prevent the audit team from finding out that there are internal control problems. And I had been I had been actually interviewed for the job of general counsel, and the um, the firm, the executive search firm, asked me why you know what's going on here. And I said the World Bank is out of compliance on the capital markets; its financial statements are inaccurate. And um, at that point. That group was required to tell the board what I had said, that there was a compliance problem. And the the information was never revealed, what the executive search firm said about that problem. So, uh, and that was, that was something that the U.S. Congress was asking for, and the World Bank was stonewalling. So, so when, the, when I, you know, got involved in just the financial disclosure issues, and I was on both sides of the problem. I was saying the financial information is not going to the bondholders. And that was my job. And during that interview for for uh, general counsel, um, I was, for all practical purposes, the board had appointed me as the as the general counsel at that point. I knew that that was the outcome of that of that disclosure. So when I have been, you know, signing various um, documents, as acting general counsel. It's because I knew that the World Bank had to be brought into compliance. And the U.S. Congress backed us up. The, you know, the other whistleblowers were also reporting, you know, cover-ups of financial information. And, and Congress knew that it had, had to protect the uh, taxpayers who were going to be making contributions to the World Bank. There had to be accurate financial information. So I mean, it, it was kind. Of, it's kind of like um, if you put a place marker in a book, and you know that people have always got to go back to that page. You can't turn the page. 
And I knew that the World Bank had got to be brought into compliance. And the U.S. Congress knew that, and they put a condition in the capital increase. They said that the capital increase could not be dispersed for the U.S. contribution until the effects of retaliation against whistleblowers had been eliminated. Mm -hmm. So I would say to the board, you're not going to get your U.S. contribution. And and I also went to, um, there's a, a national taxpayers union. I went to them, and they put a blog up on me. So we kept putting, you know, roadblocks in to make it very difficult for this corrupt group to go anywhere. They would, and so, for example, um, in the in this uh, appropriations legislation, the Congress said that they would know that the effects of retaliation against whistleblowers had been eliminated if the Secretary of the Treasury would tell them. So I went to the World Bank. They wouldn't let me in. And then I went to the U.S. Congress appropriations committees, and I said, Timothy Geithner was lying to you because the effects of retaliation against whistleblowers has not been eliminated. And two weeks after I did that, that's when Timothy Geithner left. And I know that it was effective because in the new appropriations legislation, they decided to change the entity that was going to give the report. It's now the Secretary of State instead of the Treasury Department. But there's also um, Ben Bernanke got involved in this because there's something called the National Advisory Council on international monetary and financial policies. And that's chaired by the uh, Secretary of Treasury, but it's got the chairman of the Federal Reserve in that group. And I went to that group, and I I went to their um, ombudsman, and I went to the um, audit, you know, the internal audit uh, department in the Fed. And I said, the Fed is required to bring the World Bank into compliance, and it hasn't done that. And then I, you know, I also sent the complaint to the Bank for International Settlements. So, you know, they 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 have just not been able to um, extricate themselves from this problem. It's like they've been they've been hogtied. They are corrupt, and they've been proven as corrupt. And the securities laws can be enforced. So, when you know, when you were saying, oh, the people feel so disempowered, and they they they're disgruntled, and the world is no good, and they don't know what to do. Well, it's it, it's very true that things are bad, but it's also very true that the culprits who are responsible for making this bad are all um, capable of being held responsible. We've been taking pictures of what they've been doing. They're exposed. They have, you know, it's not just, oh, I think they did a bad thing. We have shown how they have not done a good thing, how they have been derelict in their obligations. and. You know, in this um, discussion that I had with Antal Fekete, the the whole governance structure in the United States has been uh, shown to be totally um, corrupted, which is to say that um, the Congress is required now to call a constitutional convention because two-thirds of the state legislatures have um, more than two-thirds, 42 of them, um, have asked for a constitutional convention to clean up the corruption, and the Congress is refusing to call this. So Congress has now discredited itself. It it has no role in it. It, it is uh, demonstrably um, corrupt. Definitely. Now, the the uh, I don't think you would get to too many uh, you know complaints on that on that remark again. But let me return to that point in terms of. Uh, where things would go uh, in terms of reform of the system, you know. And there's another thing on top of this, of course. I mean, I understand that you've been uh, guided, I guess, by your own moral compass to a certain degree. But since you brought in later here in the, the model into the picture, this we could ask this as an extension question that, you know, I don't know if you're acting on your own opinions and your own moral compass primarily, or if you are in some way kind of dictated to by the, this power transition model that you mentioned. But again, now let me return to that question how would you see, want to see the economic system being reformed? What kind of model would replace what we have right now? Okay, I have been working with all kinds of whistleblowers. So there's one um, environmentalist who has his own vision of what has to happen with um, water that's, that's uh, degraded. And, and he, somehow the Vatican f- managed to find this guy and gave him the role of being the administrator of the world's wealth. And he took it. He was going to sign it. Can you imagine that? 
And I said, you better not do that or you're going to plunge the world into a, a currency war. You can't do that. You can't sign it. Anyway, this guy calls me up from time to time because he's got strong opinions about what he wants to see. And I said, you are not the one who's going to decide this. We have been living in a world that's been um, ruled and run, and it's not going to happen, and it's not going to continue. And, you know, I'm just not dealing with this guy anymore. He obviously has visions of grandeur. And, and, he, and he is or was part of this coalition? Well, it's a loose coalition. We are sharing information among each other. Right. And he, he was the one, to his credit, who came to me to tell me that there was a trust agreement for nine quadrillion dollars that he was going to sign. I said, you better not sign that. And, and, and who is he? Why did he get that offer? It's the Jesuits. It's the Vatican that's been the prime mover here. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, but your, so your gentleman who, who uh, had uh, opinions about the water, the environmentalist, he said, you said he was in a position of getting to sign and be the, be the main tr trustee for this. Right? Exactly. But how he did was, he, and I told him why did he they want to give it to him? I told him he was not going to sign anything, any such thing, that that would be totally corrupt. And that what has to happen if he wants to get involved in environment, that he has got to show to the people who will have control of their own money that he's got value and they'll hire him. And otherwise he's out to lunch. We're not doing this top down. We're doing this bottom up. But. The, the main thing is that it, it's, you know, I'm saying this, but this is um, this is also a, a hypothesis, right? Uh, you know, I'm, t I'm talking about how I would like to see, see the world escape from this impending, um, it's called backwardation of gold. Right, yeah. Where, where the, the paper currencies crash and there's nothing else there and there's no way to, to finance anything and people starve. Um, and this this can't be allowed to happen. So we you know we have to um, prevent this. We have to move fast on this. And then after that, I think we have to move extremely slowly and transparently, and learn from our mistakes. And um, you know just keep iterating how we're going to do this going forward. And as far as the Bretton Woods, so, I see them simply. So, the, so sorry to interrupt, but so there isn't a clear kind of plan or path really laid out at this stage about how we would move forward if and when a uh, current power structure is detoppled and something else is to put in its place. So that's well, kind of a blank page right now? Well, what has to be clear and move swiftly is is preventing this gold backwardation. We can't be, you know, you'll see in this um, interview where Antal Fekete wants to have committees. I said, we don't have the luxury of committees. We are now at the edge and we have got to be decisive and, and make sure that things um, don't, deteriorate so that we can't do anything anymore but you know that has that has got to be done very uh smoothly and quickly um but after that i think what we have to do you know I, i've been on a lot of alternative media programs and in particular there are there are some people who are so allergic to uh, government activity that they um they you, there's no way that you can um convince them that anything that you would ever do would be good. Yeah. And so and so what you have to do in in especially when we're coming out of this kind of massive corruption is we have got to um we've got to gain some credibility and and to, even if we had the best programs to superimpose them from the top would be a terrible mistake. We have to learn how to govern ourselves. So we're going to have to have, you know, trial and error. Um but in those areas where we just don't have the luxury of time, we're going to have to be very um, decisive. But I, I think that's just um, in the case of currency. That's all I'm thinking of. And to do it in a way that you can then um, go back and and fine tune it or throw it out and do something else later. But in terms of the United States, we have this constitutional convention. We have a means, we have a mechanism for fixing what's what's corrupt in our country. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And the the reason, by the way, I want to mention that as well, why I'm so adamant about this particular problem is because, again, as I said before, sometimes you stretch for the cure, but you're so desperate for it that you don't know if it's going to aid and, and uh, or if it's going to make it worse. And and something that is a, the, the, kind of a, a truism, if you will, is that big organizations, whether it's the World Bank or if it's a major government like this, where so much 
money and power flow, it's it's bound to attract the criminals. That's just how the, this works. And so if there is a a system that you know replaces the other, we're still going to be stuck with the same people. And and even worse, if it's a more powerful system, it's if, if it's a more centralized system, then those people who surely soon enough will will ascend within this political structure, whatever whatever it is, will gain even more power and control. And that's why it's so dangerous. That's why it's so important to really try to you know have have a plan to keep these people out but at the same time you know who who are we to tell how other people should live their lives and everything there's a number of you know kind of more philosophical questions that that comes on on on, on top of this but you know th- this this very claim that 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 you saw within the world bank for, ex- for example that okay we're setting up this organization because it's the welfare for all it's to help the poor you know and this this very argument disarms people's suspicion and they they you know run it on an emotional level but then what ends up happening, of course, is that the people, they, they line their own pockets with this money. So, you know, we, we're always going to come back to that very same problem, no matter what system we have or, or administrative body or, bo- you know, board or anything, right? Well, all I, all I can say, Henrik, is that I'm extremely sympathetic to that. And I think humanity has a lot of lessons to, to learn. Um, and I, I don't, I see the World Bank um, and the IMF, the Bretton Woods institutions, as a springboard, as a platform. If they should decide to dismantle themselves and do something else, that would be perfectly fine. It's just that you have to have a platform from which to agree to what it is you're going to do. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. I, I think, yeah, so for example, if you were to ask me what. I would see for the World Bank. I don't see the World Bank lending program. And besides, if we have all this wealth, which is what I think we do, we're not going to need that. Maybe there's a core of technical assistance where if countries think that the expertise at the World Bank is valuable, they can come to it for that. I mean, it's going to have to it's going to have to um, face all of the um, criticism that it's that it's earned and it's going to have to. Um, respond to that i i see it i see it as a a place for um a, a platform and that's all and so how would you suggest that things would move on from this stage and again just uh, is this something that's being dictated to to the the coalition that you've been talking about from this power transition model or what what runs the 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 agenda if you will for you guys at this point we are such a lean, mean machine. You have no idea. It's so incredibly ad hoc. Um, it, it's pathetic. But, you know, we've gotten the job done. That's what I can say for us. Um, I think that it's going to be extremely challenging to move from um, having been um, degraded as, a, as humanity for so many centuries to um, humanity will be in charge of its own future. And we're going to have to, we're going to have to, I don't have an answer for you. It, and it would be a mistake if I did. So it is a, something that is nebulous, if you will, as we, you know, proceed forward this now. And again, the, the only reason I'm asking is because it's always interesting to hear, you know, we, we all can point to the problems and everything else. That's very easy to do. And then, uh, then it ends in that, you know, context in many regards, because we don't know how to, how to have a system where you, where we prevent bad people from ascending the, uh, the, the the systems of power that we develop so we're back in the same you know it's like re refurnishing uh you know uh, on the titanic or something you know it's just it doesn't really no, doesn't the, really matter you know i don't think so for, so for example um the the things that i have seen um the role of the legal profession i you know i, I there's two constitutions it turns out that the lawyers most of them have been there to make a system that's so complex and non-transparent so, so it can be um, the, the bad that's that's happening out of that system can be hidden. That's what the lawyers have been doing. That's and and um, they've been licensing themselves. So I would say the number one thing for the legal profession, and and of course you know there was an amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, which was hidden. It said that that um, members of the bar um, could not serve two masters, and they just erased that although it had been ratified. Um, I mean, and this, so what I'm saying is that licensing of lawyers is going to be done by the uh, people that use the legal services. And any lawyer that's going to start 
you know, and, and they're not going to have exclusive rights to act within the legal system. And the same for the accountants. I mean, um, you should see what Elaine Colville and I found out about the accounting profession. The accountants will no longer be in charge of licensing other accountants. It's they've they've simply been there to uh, allow the rich to rob everybody um, behind the scenes. And they put up a couple of structures to um, to disguise all of the the theft that's going on. No, that there, there's going to be a total revamp of those professions. They've dishonored themselves. Maybe they they those professions shouldn't exist anymore, and just people should should do the functions. I, I'm just saying, the the first thing that we're going to have to do is be very clear about what's actually happened. One of the conversations I had today was somebody who got um, a settlement in a lawsuit, and he said. Um, are we just going to wipe the slate clean? I had to work very hard to get this settlement. It was never paid. And we're going to have a lot of questions to answer. Um, but one thing I do know is that if we spend all of our time looking back and none of our time looking forward, um, we're, we're going we're gonna to be in, in terrible shape. So we're, we're going to we're gonna have to answer some pretty thorny questions um, on the run. And we're going to have to figure out who's going to answer these questions. Nothing is written in stone. Certainly. Let me ask you about some of the other things here. Is there is there a conspiracy by the same you know criminal network that we've been talking about to uh, to crash the, the 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 currencies of the world at this point? Yes, of course. That's what we're dealing with. They call it quantitative easing. That's what that was. I, I can show you the, the graph. Right, and definitely. Actually, some, of them, some of them had meetings and, and explained it among themselves, and a couple of them let, let some comments slip. Yes, it was deliberate. But, you know, as I said, in fencing, they hoisted themselves by their own petard because having created this crisis, they didn't think that we would be fleet enough to diagnose it and come up with a solution in time. And that's exactly what we've done, and that's what's going to happen. And the likelihood that it happens is 90 to 95 percent. Well, again, according to the model. So tell us more about the solution then to this. It's wonderful. There is more gold in the world that people know about. And if you read this interview, if you listen to this interview, um, I've uploaded just a, a handful of the documents that Wolfgang Struck has given me. Uh, who is, can, tell us a bit who Wolfgang, Wolfgang okay. Struck is, for those who don't know. We need to detail some of these people here. Yes, he is a German banker and lawyer. And um, he's been in the Philippines for 20 years. And he's been in touch with the person who Marcos designated as the... Um, I call it the signature authority, but the but the real signature authority is a trust. So Fer the, Ferdinand Marcos in in the Philippines. That's right. Ferdinand yeah. Marcos was vilified as as if he were a robber of the the wealth of the of the Philippines. But in actual fact, humanity owe, owes this uh, man uh, a huge huge debt because he set up the legal system that would enable us. Uh, so Wolfgang found found all the all these documents, and he he's got the signature authority. Wolfgang has. And, and again, do, do you know why Ferdinand Marcos uh, wrote that over in in to, to Wolfgang Struck? Why is he? Uh... No, no, he didn't do it to Wolfgang Struck. There was a young person. He had to find a, a human being, but he set it up as a trust. It's the trust, not the human being. The right. human being is the signatory of the trust. And Wolfgang is the legal representative of the signatory and has the power and the authority to sign over this gold. And he and Wolfgang has um, allocated 170,500 metric tons of gold to the United States. And there's uncut dollars. This is what John F. Kennedy was doing 10 days before he was assassinated by the Jesuits. Um, when Gambino got out of jail uh, last month, Gambino said that uh, the mafia fired the kill shot for John F. Kennedy from a sewer. And that's also one of the indicators that you can see that the coalition is actively um, winning, because I don't think the mafia would have made the statement if they thought the Jesuits were going to were in control still. 
Well, it's a, definitely an interesting, different take on the whole, uh, you know, parts of the Yamashita's gold, Marcos and everything else. We we had uh, Sterling Seagrave with us who wrote the Gold Warriors book, and he, of course, have detailed what a long fight, if you will, it has been for okay, the, the U.S. Okay, you should talk to Wolfgang. You should talk mm-hmm. to Wolfgang about the, the accurate information because the book is not accurate. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. All right. Um, so this is a different take on that altogether than in that regard. Yeah, it's going to be such a different take on history. People's heads are going to turn. So let me let me just give you um, an appetizer to this. Um, Queen Victoria had a twin named Prince Talano. And this guy, I don't know what he did to um, alienate the, the court. Maybe he was autistic. I don't know. But um, they shipped him off to the Philippines. And he uh, married a young princess there, but he also went around the world siring children. One of his offspring was Adolf Hitler. Another one of his children was General Yamashita. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, uh, they're re- all of them are related? Yes. Okay. With Queen Elizabeth, obviously. They're, uh, I don't you know, I'd have to look at the genealogy chart are they nephews or whatever it is anyway they're you know they're closely related and what does that tell us about uh, what has gone on around these people are they uh, controlled they're on somebody's uh, clock here or <laughs> how should we interpret that well just think about it all of the wealth of this royalty has been put in this collateral account so if they want money they have to dance to the you know the tune of the piper they, they they've got an allowance their money is not theirs now, so it sounds a little bit, as we talk more here then, Karen, that this is something that, uh, you know, someone like myself and other people who are listening from the from the outside of this world is not something that we can, uh, you know, verify or, or, or confirm. But at the same time, we have fingerprints of things going on in the world that we see. And we might suspect if things unfold from here on out that certain things fall into place on the geopolitical chessboard that we might assume, okay, that's because of this group, you, the group that you've been talking about that you're belonging to do. But in that regard, what is this... That's way too passive. That's way, way, way too passive. We have all the documents. You hold us to account. We'll show them to you. If you don't think they're reliable and verifiable, then you just keep looking till you get them. We have those documents for you. Can you send them to us so we can take a look at them? Yeah, I have I have put them up on the YouTube video of my interview with um, uh, with Antal Feketa, and I said at the end of that interview – that this is just the beginning and we're all going to be working together. And and when I said we, I said all of the governments of the world, I said all of the militaries. And principally the U.S. military, the Russian military, and the Chinese military were not having a war. But those militaries are going to be very helpful in getting the gold um, out of those banks with the legal authorized signatory. Doesn't belong to them. They've been they've been earning a lot of um, money on that because it's been secret and they've been, you know, it's not theirs, but they've been earning, um, you know, investment on it. So people within government and military today that are corrupt are uh, not going to do anything. They're going to sit by idly, passively, and not be able to do anything about this as the system is kind of, and the power of that system is taken away from them. Or how will this unfold, do you think? Okay, what what has happened is the cat is out of the bag. Um, Toto has pulled the curtain aside. Everybody sees the Wizard of Oz and the projection screen. And now everybody is going to be watching and participating as we go forward. Our, our situation right now is that everybody's looking at the wizard and they know that there is a lot of gold and it belongs to them. It doesn't belong to the governments. It belongs to them, the people. So and we're all going to be rich. Watch, yeah, everybody's going to be rich. That's exactly what wonderful. What, that's, and and <laughs> if everybody isn't rich, if everybody isn't rich, and everybody's going to be watching at the same time, including all three armies and, you know, Air Force. Everybody knows that everybody's rich. That's where we are. So can we just sit uh, idly by and wait for the no, cash or uh, what's no. going to happen? You, okay, you just, you just said they're not used to being watched. You better watch every move. 
people better organize themselves to get themselves organized. Now, let me talk a little bit about currency, what I see, although, as I said, it's not up to me, but um, there's um, a German-Argentinian economist named Silvio Giselle. I'm probably mispronouncing his name, but this man said that the most important currency is actually the local currency. If you issue, if the, the, the villages have their own currency and all of the merchants and people in that village will trade with that local currency, you will have wonderful economies all springing up all over the place. There won't be any such thing as unemployment. And that, you know, that ha there are laws now that, that are called legal tender laws that say that um, nobody can, can have any currency except for the legal currency and there's a monopoly of it and it's the central bank. And we're going to do the opposite. There's going to be no such thing as a legal tender law. And then, of course, people are going to have to figure out which currencies are valuable and how to, how to um, manage with international trade, but they'll, you know, there'll be ways to get around that. I'm sure we can figure that out. So, okay. So the main uh, thing is I understand it here. That this is something that, that's going to be handled really on a, on a legal kind of paperwork level, correct? Well, the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to get everybody to get that gold out of its um, prison because we cannot have gold go into hiding or we'll go into the dark ages. So we need the armies for that. We need everybody in the governments working in the Bretton Woods institutions to get that gold out of where it is and, and respect the authorized signatory who's going to allocate that gold to the government, not to the governments, to the people in those countries. Yeah? And we're going to have to find a way to do it. So I mean, it's not, not going to be simple. Right, right. So, so those who are in a position today, Karen, to initiate force that's those who can you know they can come and, and knock on your door and 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 arrest you it doesn't have to be a illegal uh, you know precedent for any of this that's going on lately they ultimately have you know atomic weapons at their disposal that's how far they have been willing to go at least in the past to to keep you know the the order in line if you will i guess my qu my big bigger question on top of that is this this established network of of military and government that's very much in play how is that going to be removed and their ability to exuberate force upon other people that are trying to change this power game and the situation like yourselves? Okay. Let's, um, th there's, there's an article that I think would make this a lot easier. And that is, um, there's, um, a, a retired, um, Marine who wrote a book and, and he wrote a one page summary of the book. Um, and what he wrote was that, um, this, Corrupt world, whatever you want to call it, disease, um, could only continue in existence if two things happened. That people didn't know about, about it, that it was completely secret, and if the U.S. military would enforce it. And those two um, conditions no longer apply. Why not? Well, you're we're discussing it now. Yeah, but uh, no, I know that definitely. I just again, I'm uh, there. We have the military; they have the you know machine guns in their hands, and they're taking orders from one guy, and then voila, the next day they'll take order from another guy, and the situation will be changed. So no, I don't no, know how that uh, that not, switch occurs. That's not how it is. Okay, for example, Syria didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? There were there were there was a meeting about about Syria, saying we don't have the budget for Syria. There, there's pushback there, and then there's been a reaction to the pushback. There's been some personnel shuffling, and then there's been, um, you know, the the heroes that prevented the uh, nuclear device from exploding on the 8th of October and getting fired. There are a lot of people that are very disgruntled about this, and um, the Russians are also very unhappy that the person that was um, stationed in in Russia was relieved of, of his duties. Um, you know, it's a pooch, and this is not acceptable. So you, you have all of the, P, all of the uh, military officers now who have been, you know, I, I've been in touch with the inspector general of the Department of Defense to say that these, um, these personnel practices are totally unacceptable, and they'll be reversed, and the people that, 
that have been asking for them are themselves going to have to answer to the people. Yeah, because, you know, it's just not sitting well. People don't like the idea that, th that those heroes that prevented uh, a nuclear device from being detonated are being punished. Yeah? So, I mean, th this, is, this is not a typical situation. This is, these are, I mean, make, make no um, mistake about it. These are historic uh, times that we're living in. And we're going um, to we're going to have to do things that we've never done before. We're going to have to pull together like humanity. I mean, what I said in this um, interview with with Antal Fekete is that we're not having a, a nuclear war. We're not having the three armies and military forces fighting each other, much as that's what the Jesuits have been trying to foment. It's not happening. It's not in the cards. And if you read you know, the, the, um, this book that, that was written by um, this Michael O'Bannon. I mean, it's one of the best written things I've ever read. I don't know who wrote it or, you know, if he's just a one-off guy that managed somehow to write a masterpiece. But if you read this, it was him that said that those three militaries are working together. It's not something I'm making up. So the, the military will uh, will slowly change uh, under command and, and someone else who's good intended will uh, have control over the militaries of the world? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying that all of humanity is now aware of the plot and scheme and control of the Jesuits and they are out of a job. And those, you know, tricksters are not going to be controlling the military or the politicians that think they're controlling the military. They're just not going to manage that anymore. It's exposed. And, and, and how, we, how we go forward and what we do in response, we will all work together on that. But it's not like one world government. We're all working together to dismantle this um, corruption. And then it's going to be the individual countries working from the local places up. I mean, they're going to see who's been a, a traitor in their country. They're going to they're gonna have to come to grips with it and figure out why that system allowed that to happen and what should be different. Nobody's going to come in and tell them to do it differently. They're going to do it differently themselves in their own sweet time. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I'm not trying to make it difficult for you, Karen. I'm just not understanding some of the concepts, how this would, be, would occur. And again, I, I'm saying that from the point of view that there are there are so many people in the world. There are so many allegiances, agendas, conspiracies, mini groups within, you know, groups. There are ma mafia, mafia out there. There are, you know, lesser organized crime. There are more organized crime. So I guess at, at, if there was a, a power topple at, 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 on this level, I just see a, a number of people, a number of organizations rushing in that to fill that void of the power grab. So no, therefore, no. that's why I'm right. seeing that it's so difficult. Okay. To, to, to perform that switch, you know what I mean? I don't think it's that difficult. Let's just let's just follow the money for a minute, okay? Look at what's happening with tax revenues because of the fiat currencies and the fact that there's two constitutions in the United States. So all of the tax revenues are going first to the city of London, and they're keeping about 40% of it, I understand, and then 60% of that money is going to the Vatican. Mm-hmm. Everybody, everybody writes me and says, where, where are the documents to prove this? And, I, you know, I, I send the treaties and um, anyway. Um, yeah, well, so where, that, where are the documents? Where can we read about that? I'd love to read more about that, by the way. Yeah, okay. I, I, um, at the end of our conversation, I'll send you the documents I have on that. Perfect. I mean, it starts, Great. It starts with the, the treaty of 1214 when John um, had this confrontation um, with, with the Pope. And, you know, that's why – that. You know, the, everybody thinks the UK escaped from from Rome, but it, it really did not. And everybody thinks the United States escaped from the UK, and it really did not. Um, and anyway, uh, people are going to have to get used to history. Devin, Karen, that, Karen, can we share those documents with our audience as well? Absolutely. Right. I mean, absolutely. Um, glad to share it. But um, I mean, what can I say? We have been um, hoodwinked as humanity, and we've been very passive, and people have got to get used to um, being consumers of the news instead of just switching on the telly and just, you know, allowing the, themselves to be brainwashed. 
that's just and and by the way, we we also have to look at at what's been going on. When I use the word brainwash, that reminded me of MK Ultra. There is technology that people don't know about, um, which has been poisoning um, people's perception of each other and the world, and and that has got to be uh, exposed and sorted through. And I don't have documents on that. I mean, I've I've seen some testimony of young people that were, you know, they they risked their lives to tell the U.S. Congress about about that program. And the U.S. Congress did nothing about it. And that was, you know, years ago, and they've been developing the technology even further. I mean, we have, um, when, you know, when we tell this story and we point to all of the terrible things that have happened, you know, um, one of the things that Wolfgang said was people let it happen. I mean, we've got to, um, we've got to take credit for having been um, passive and duped. And um, there are a number of people that are going to have a very hard time um, swallowing all of the uh, the new reality. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. This, these are definitely things we've uh, discussed on the on the program for many many years. There, these are things that we've uh, we've been aware of for a long time. And I guess again, I'm I'm just I'm I'm not seeing the tide turning anytime soon, and that's why I'm uh, so eagerly trying to question you on these things to see well, let's, you know let's, what let's is going wait. on. How does this how does this even happen? You know. We are going to see the money turn very quickly, or we are going to see our whole world crumble. And let me go back to that point again. Then, if we had a, an, an active conspiracy by the uh, by the network to crash the economy, in that case, what what would they benefit from that? If they do that, if they go that way, because we would then say whatever you want to do is fine with us. We don't want this kind of turmoil. We want you to give us um, currency in our arms, so that if we ever want anything. We have to be validated. Right. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's what I'm seeing as well. And that's where the danger lies. I think it, it, it's, it's the, the more desperate things get, the more people cling on to alternatives that, uh, again, might not be the best for them. You know, and that's why it's it's a it, it's a time to be really cautious and 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 think also as opposed to just act for the sake of it or, or in desperation or on, on emotional level. I guess what I'm trying to say is we are not acting in desperation. And the thing that we're doing is such a wonderful thing. I don't. Um, I don't think. I mean, you'll see in the in the video. You'll see how um, I I deal with uh, Antal Feketa's suggestion that we have some committee meetings when we're on the edge of a precipice. I said no. There's there's not going to be any committee meetings on this. We are simply going to get clean, good, uh, solid currency that's backed by assets out there right now. And then we'll we'll have the luxury of retrofitting and and doing whatever else we want to do cautiously and carefully. But this this um, this problem with uh, the gold backwardation, no, we're going to be decisive on this. And and it's not. And when I say we're going to be decisive on this, this is a prayer because without people listening in this radio broadcast and understanding what I'm you know what we're all saying and what the danger is and why we have to act and act decisively and and very quickly. Um, and this is just what John F. Kennedy was about to do when he was assassinated. So there should be no um, ends, ifs, or buts about this. We should just do it. So, okay, let me ask you a little bit more here. What What is next, I guess, on the on the agenda, both for you, but also for the group there? And, and, and when we see something occurring within the world, and we suspect what it might be, obviously you guys are, are sharing information of that, but... Will we be able to something I try to get to before there see the, the the fingerprints, if you will, of the of the work that you and all the other people in the coalition, as you call it, doing right now? Is that kind of some? Is that something we can see? And how would we identify that? <laughs> you just talk to us, and we'll answer you, and we'll show you. You know, it, people just go to my website and see. You know, the documents that, that have been generated in this in this um, saga, and the chronology, so you see how this has been going forward. And you, you know, the easiest thing is you just read Lars Schall's um, article, and that that pretty much um, tells you what it was and what it is. Well, there's a, a bunch of links that we're going to have up here, including the the videos that they've been referring to a number of times, so people can take a look at that. There's some the other ones to the uh, network of global uh, corporate control over in uh, Zurich that study, and there's a number of other articles you mentioned from Lars Schall and everything else. So we'll have that on the program page for all you guys who are listening who want to check those sources out and get into this in more detail. 
Uh, but give us your website as well, then, Karen, so people know how to go. And again, if there's anything else you'd like to, you know, announce or talk about or, or give out any more further information about what's uh, going to happen next year for you. Well, um, the website is k a h u d is in David e s dot n e t. That's k a h u d e s dot n e t. And um, I'm going to be, right now, for next steps, I'm going to be trying to write a book um, and get it out there so that uh, people will have something, you know, just in one place because, you know, I've been giving a number of interviews, et cetera. But that way people can um, get a, a flavor of it. Um, but, you know, one of, the, one of the, the other questions that people ask me is they say, you know, this is all very improbable. How on earth? Um, why is it that, that you're still alive, you know, and, and the rest of us? And, you know, by the way, there are a number of people that were, um, you know, not only um, killed and damaged and intimidated, um, but it, it's just because of the nature of what it is that we're working on. This is ending a cover-up. So if something were to have happened to us, it would have just simply accelerated the um, – realization that there was a cover-up and this is you know this is something these people understood very very well um what the coalitions were and there was no way to stop it once elaine and i got our statements up on the uk parliament website there was a 95 percent likelihood and so their challenge has been to try to prevent us from taking the next step forward in a way that um wasn't wasn't going to make it worse for themselves and they invariably made things worse for themselves. They just made, you know, for some reason, and, you know, we've been talking about this among ourselves. Why is it that they would do things in a way that, that was just, it was almost like a cartoon? They, they were just um, leaving fingerprints all over. If they're trying to keep themselves secret, and, and they're doing these stupid things um, that make it so much easier for us to point out that there's a problem. So the very first thing that, you know, if, if anybody's skeptical about all of this, the very first thing to do is to look at what you don't see. Where is the mainstream media on this? If there's all this gold, where is the mainstream media? And you say, well, why, you know, how do you know other than the fact that you're telling us that there's this gold? I mean, you can see the documents, but... Um, there, there's a, a lord who um, asked something about a trillion dollars that showed up and I think it was the Bank of Scotland one day and then disappeared the next. Um, there, there are real um, proof. There, there exists real proof that this is not just, um, you know, uh, so much uh, hype. Definitely. All right. Well, good stuff. Thanks for your time today, Karen. We'll, we'll obviously keep watching this, keeping an eye on this. It's, uh, you know, we'll keep watching and listening to see what this, where this goes. And we'll let our audience judge for themselves and decide if they want to learn more and uh, look into this for themselves further. We'll round up here then. And the website is kahudes.net. And that's uh, K-A-H-U-D-E-S dot net. We'll have that website up and uh, all the related links as well then, Karen. So thank you again for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Enric. Okay, okay, ladies and gentlemen, there's uh, quite a bit that we're asked to believe in this interview. I hope you consider what has been discussed and uh, that you make up your own mind. Um, my point of concern here is that if the world economic system is to be reformed, if we are to get uh, a new guard or a new administrative body of people or anything really that, that changes, anything that uh, we are asked to uh, turn around, we should be very careful so that the new guard is not worse than the old and that we do not get ourselves deeper ensnared into the web as we're trying to fight our way out of it. Kind of think about the the Obama analogy. You know, people were so desperate for change and something different. Um, and in my view, politically, uh, of course, it has gone even worse since, since that time. So that's kind of a, a, a microcosm version of that. So, you know, desperate times produces desperate measures and that's not always... A pretty sight. It can be uh, quite ugly, in fact. I hope you see what I mean with that point, and I hope that that makes sense to you. All right, well, the final call, as always, we leave up to you to uh, decide for yourself. Oh, and we asked Karen to provide the links to the documents that she mentioned, and uh, we have those linked up on the page for this program. 
either on RedEyesCreations.com uh, or you can go to RedEyesMembers.com if you're uh, one of our beloved members who support our work. And uh, we have those linked there for you. So next up on Red Eyes Radio, we have David Icke and uh, Ulla Dammegård, then Daniel Estlin and Brian Forster together with L.A. Marzuli to name a few. So check out our archives at RedEyesMembers.com for the full broadcast. We are free from commercials and website ads. And we have memberships available for the price of about two cups of coffee per month. Um, we have three month subscriptions going all the way up to two years available for you, whatever suits your needs. Have a great rest of your day and uh, thank you for listening again. My thanks to the crew as always. Have a great weekend, folks. We'll uh, talk to you in just a few days then. Keep your uh, mind sharp and on target and uh, we'll talk to you in a few days. Bye-bye. Control had cleverly set up a screen of disinformation and they would and and you know it's only relatively recently that i found out about all of this gold and the function of the imf and the world bank in making sure that this gold is not stolen and there have been a lot of attempts to steal the gold and a lot of bribes and that hasn't worked has it now i want to talk more about that there's many components to what you just mentioned that we need to kind of discuss in more detail but let, let's back up a little bit here uh, and I want to ask you about the coalition more. I've heard a couple of interviews with you previously, but I haven't heard much about who is in, coal in the coalition, you know, and what principles, I guess, it's, it's run on or how it's run. It is very, very loose. And I think if you were to, um, I think the best way to understand it is to, um, well, I can give you one example. Um, there is now a fourth credit rating agency that's owned by the Russian and Chinese. And that is serving as a very strong incentive to get rid of this corruption because the US credit rating has now been downgraded by the Chinese. It started out being downgraded by Standard and Poor and then the Attorney General in the United States, Eric Holder, sued Standard and Poor. But I, I started writing the credit rating agencies when a UK lawyer advised me to do this. Um, I had gone to the UK Parliament and I guess this lawyer felt that it wasn't fair for the UK to have to shoulder the whole burden. And when I say the UK, it's, you know, these countries are not monolithic. There are forces that are fighting the corruption and there are forces that have been totally co-opted and they're, the way they act is treasonous to the interests of the people in those countries. And, you, you know, you can rank the countries in degree of the um, control that, that they're under or the degree of freedom that they have. But um, th this, the group, I, I'll, you know, I'll tell you who, who the group is that's behind that network of control. It's the Jesuits. And there's also some groups behind them, but we're still working among the coalition to understand precisely who those, those groups are. And if I, if I get out and start telling you, you won't listen to the rest of it. People are advising me not to speak about who's behind the Jesuits. Why not? No, no, I, th I think you should definitely. I mean, here's the opportunity to really get to the core of it. So why not? Give us a little tidbit. Okay, then let me tell you um, what I heard. I'll quote, I'll quote the person who um, gave me that information, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you how we're trying to verify it. Okay? All right. Um, this is a neurologist who, by the way, um, noticed that, Somebody who was who had the same theory, uh, and I, I wish I could remember his name. But anyway, um, he died a sudden death at the age of 34. What is the theory? If you look at the uh, picture of um, Akhenaten and his uh, daughters, the pharaohs, they had these huge headdresses. That was to hide their large skulls. They're hominids. They're not human beings. They're very very smart. They're not creative, they're mathematical. And they they had a much stronger force in the um, earlier Ice Age. And um, one of the things that, um, that this scientist, his name is Edward Spencer, is talking about, you know, there are a lot of museums that have skulls of these, um, uh, some people call them coneheads by slang. Some people say it's more than one species. 
um, it's pretty clear that that group um, is not able to um, the off they, they may produce offspring in in mating with female humans but that offspring is not fertile or we would see more of these um, these hominids and uh, and they have been um, you know making themselves scarce but uh, when when Edward was giving me all this information, I shared it with a man in Portugal who um, went and had a meeting with a bank, and he sent us uh, an email the next day and said that there was a, a, um, a big skull person with bright blue eyes at the meeting of that bank. The, the, this person, um, uh, the bank had made some improper loans to his father. And so he was meeting with a bank about those improper loans. And, you know, he said, he said, did I think that um, our emails had been read? And, and were these um, hominids deliberately showing themselves to us now? Um, there's another person who said she saw some of them running around in Egypt. But if you look at the um, statues, you see all these big headdresses. And then there are some other times when people show up with, with these uh, improbable headdresses, and you also see them in the Vatican. By the way, those those crazy um, uh, I forget what you call them that that the people in the Vatican wear. That that would also um, hide those big skulls. Well, interesting. That takes uh, things in a bit of a different direction. So you're basically saying that these uh, um, beings, whatever they really are, then maybe not human hominids. We we've talked about elongated skulls and other. Uh, oddities before on the program, so we, we're familiar with it in that reg regard. But uh, you're basically saying that that's the the power behind the throne in this case. Yes, and when people talk about extraterrestrials, that's um, that started happening when there was a technology developed to um, s make suggestions inside people's brains. So people who thought that they were being abducted, something happened to them. But the experiences that they felt as being real were things that were uh, that they didn't actually experience, but that 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 technology was able to suggest to them, so that they they had vivid memory that predicts how coalitions will form. And um, I worked with him on a project in Ghana, but after that, I asked him if he would allow me to model rule of law inside the World Bank, and he did allow me to model that. And uh, you can read the model. Um, I didn't realize at the time that Yasek had also done a model, not of the World Bank, but of the world at large. So I had, uh, but my model and his model agreed very fundamentally because the World Bank is, um, it's like a microcosm of the world. Many international organizations, you'll have the countries with one country, one vote, but the World Bank is set up differently. Um, the country's votes are weighted by the size of their economies. So the United States, which is the largest, or the, it's considered to be the biggest economy, has 16% of the votes. And then uh, the countries go on down the line. You can see on their website how, how the um, countries are weighted. And so I modeled rule of law inside the World Bank, and I didn't realize that the corruption inside the World Bank was actually caused by the corruption outside the World Bank. That's a no-brainer, but at the time, right. I, I just didn't know that we had um, a secret group of corrupt companies that thought they owned the world, and that's what we're up against. But I'm happy to tell people that all of the countries of the world have banded together, formed a coalition, and we are now taking back the world from that corrupt bunch. And who is that corrupt bunch? It's described very, very accurately by three mathematicians at the Federal Institute of Technology who modeled the um, 43,000 transnational companies on the capital markets. Uh, and what they found out was a surprise. They found out that all of the financial institutions are actually one international institution. They call it uh, a network of control. What this sneaky group did was they took the same directors and put them on the boards of all the companies. That's called interlocking directors. And so this group has grabbed secret control of 
the um, 40% of the net worth of all of the companies traded on the capital markets and 60% of their annual earnings. And uh, anybody can read this article. Um, the way the mathematicians describe it, they say, well, this is just an accident that happened and, and we don't think the group is necessarily doing anything bad. And then Forbes ran an article and they said um, many of the holding companies are just the big pensions and they're not taking an active collusion um, interest. But that is absolutely not the case because what this group did is they bought all of the media and they have been lying systematically to all of the people who expect when they turn on the news that they're not getting propaganda. But they are. Definitely. It's, it's, um, this is the one uh the, the report, the paper is called uh, The Network of Global Corporate Control. It's the one out of Switzerland, right, uh, Zurich? Yes, that's You're talking what about. I'm talking about. That's, that's right. It was called, uh, they did it through network topology, I believe, and they, they found uh, indeed within that a, a structure of, uh, was it 147 or so uh, companies that interlocked in this way. And, and I definitely don't want to leave that tangent. That's something we need to keep in the background here all the time as we talk more about the people and everything. But I did want to ask you a little bit more about what you believe the creation of the World Bank, uh, if if this was created with that intention, as you said back in 1944 at the Bretton Woods Conference, uh, you know, along with a couple of other institutions at the same time, you know, the IMF uh, among some of the other ones, but it was the founders were John Maynard Keynes. Uh, he was a member of the Fabian Society for a short while. You had uh, Harry Dexter White and all that, and officially the World Bank was you know was formed as an international financial institution that was going to provide loans to developing countries. But do you think that it was founded on those principles or was the corruption systemic from, from day one within this organization? What do you think? Uh, it's not an easy answer um, because the main thing that the World Bank was created to do on the face of it and what many of the countries believe, don't forget the countries went and signed treaties. So it has a, a, a structure that we can take back. It was hijacked. There, there are layers within layers. And I, after I was fired, I found out that one of the main functions of the World Bank and the IMF, you know, these two organizations are really, for all practical purposes, just one organization. Right. They're across the street from each other, and there's a board of governors, which is the ministers of finance of all the member countries. And those ministers of finance gather together um, twice a year, plus there's um, a group of 25 ministers of finance that meet and consult with each other on an ongoing basis. And so um, the answer is that, yes, there was always a secret hidden agenda, but at the same time, it is a convening party. And it is um, a, a structure that the people of of uh, the earth who want to clean up this corruption in the financial system. And it is a matter of whether or not we're going to continue with Western civilization. We're on the edge. And I can also tell you that this um, stakeholder model I was uh, describing, in this uh, power transition model, it's 90 to 95% accurate. And when Elaine Colville, who is a Scottish whistleblower from the World Bank, and I got our statements up on the UK Parliament, and, you know, I'll be happy to, to give your listeners links so you can see what we were reporting to the UK Parliament. Once that happened, the model started predicting that we in the humans of things that never actually happened. That technology exists. It's very secret. It's called MK Ultra. Sure, sure, definitely. So do you... Uh... Do you personally believe this? Have you have you been able to verify any of this yourself yet or seen any of this? I think it's probably more likely than all of this extraterrestrial garbage that we're being told. All right. Well, that's very interesting. I uh, th that that takes things as I said in a bit of a different direction. We could let's keep that uh, on the back burner a little bit because but, I do want to return to that. Answer your question uh, okay. a little more um clearly, Henrik. Okay. Yeah. Um, I am not categorical about any of this. Um, one of the characteristics I have, is, there's, a, there's a trait called uncertainty avoidance, which is that you, you're not comfortable with ambiguity. You want things to be resolved. 
I'm just the opposite. I don't, I, I'm never going to close the door if there's new evidence. I right. never jump to conclusions. Yeah. So this is at this point um, a hypothesis which seems to me more likely than not, but there's a whole group of us that's trying to come to grips with this because what you have is a world in which there are secret societies and secrets and the news and the information that ought to be public is not public. So one of the most important um, uh, points that uh, a monetary economist that I just spoke to made about history, um, this is Antal Fekete. He's a Hungarian monetary economist who specializes in currency. And his point was that there was a dark ages that happened around the 400s when civilization went into arrest. And he said, we are replicating that situation. And the point I made to him was that actually we were not replicating that situation. There was a, a, a danger that that could happen, but that our situation was very different because we now have an internet and we now have exposed these this group that is behind the scenes and pulling the strings. It wants to remain unknown and hidden, and it's anything but hidden. Definitely. Now, let's let's try to clear something else up here, and I think it's a really important point, and I'll see if I can formulate this in a good way. But things today are horrible. They're, they are, in fact, so horrible that people are willing to take basically any remedy to cure this disease that we see of, of corruption and everything else. And then weaved into this, we have something completely different, which is about the reformation, not only of our economic system, but also of the political system, uh, the power hierarchy and everything else. And there are sometimes people as well so, are, that, are, that are so upset and, and frankly hateful of the system that is in place that they're willing to look anywhere else to get, to get rid of it. And although that can be a good energy of sorts to ride on, there is also at the same time a very profound danger that the very same elements that have been controlling the world in this way with the corrupt system, with the monetary system and everything else, that, that have pushed us to this edge so far that we are ready for the reformation that they are behind. What I'm, what I'm getting to here, here is that the people who are in charge that I believe are behind the, 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 the global conspiracy wouldn't ease up so easily. They would definitely want to be there and try to control the 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 game until the last drop that they have and i've for a long time been suspicious of the fact that when we're asked to reform the system people are very willing and eager to do this without really thinking okay who is behind the reformation what where are these where are the ideas coming from it's like the cl classic you know problem reaction solution and i see the same thing with the economic situation that we've been in now in the last few years that it seems to me when i start looking at the people who have been in charge of the system in charge of the economic you know chairs that have majority of the power that the the, the crash has been intentional to to uh, you know coalesce power into fewer hands to uh, centralize these systems even more so at, at the end of it i come out through the other side of this and i look at it again and i'm asking who are who are asking us to reform the system in this day and age and as you said yourself since you're part of a sting operation how do we know that what you and your coalition are asking for is not part of that very same system to reform it into something that might even be worse, if you see what I'm getting at? I'm try not trying to yeah. look down on you, of course, but this no, is a no. valid question, I think. I think it's very important for people to kick the tires and, and get clear answers. And you should never take anything at, at face value, because just imagine how we whistleblowers are functioning. Other whistleblowers come to us and we have to vet them. To find out what you know, what are they doing? Are they helping us? Are they there to derail us? So, so we, you know, um, I have nothing but respect, and um, uh, I'm the hardest. The hardest questions are the ones I welcome the most because I have the answers. And so, um, what what I what I would say, um, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to to go into this question at great depth. Because, you know, I've, every time I make a statement now, somebody comes after me and says, I'm a shell. I'm, you know, first of all, I'm, I've gotten so much publicity that how could I have gotten this publicity unless I were a disinformation agent? But the answer to that is I have won this publicity. 
um, through a lot of effort. And, you know, you can see the trajectory of, of each thing. And, and, for example, when uh, Reddit um, put one article on me, they refused to allow me to answer any of the, um, the questions that came up because Reddit, which had been started by Schwartz, who was, of course, su he s committed suicide just as he had won. Um, anyway, um, Reddit was bought by Condé Nast, which is part of this information, um, uh, disinformation um, group. So, you know, um, I think... everyone a warm welcome to our friends and our listeners from around the world this is red ice radio my name is henrik and we are based out of uh, west gothland one of the old provinces in sweden scandinavia it is indeed great to be able to speak with you and i want to uh, thank you for your interest in the kind of topics that we cover and uh, that you understand the importance of educating yourself learning and uh, investigating on your own terms finding out what we can and study both to become wiser so that we can make better choices, but also to sharpen our ability to see through the lies and the artificial constructs that are constantly being built up around us. Today we have for you an extended segment with uh, Karen Hudes on her website, kahudes.net. We can read that she studied law at Yale Law School and economics at the University of Amsterdam. She worked in the U.S. Export-Import Bank of the US from 1980 to 1985 and in the legal department of the World Bank from 1986 to 2007. After that she established the non-governmental organization committee of the international law section of the American Bar Association and the committee on multilateralism and the accountability of international organization of the American branch of the International Law Association. Now Karen has become known as a whistleblower and she's been outspoken about her time at the World Bank and the corruption that she saw there. She has also talked consequently on issues of economics, global policies of major organizations to the alternative media. And so these are the topics that we are going to attempt to get to the root of today and see if we can understand her work a little bit better. We'll see what you think. Karen Hudes, thank you for coming on with us. This is going to be interesting. I'm uh, eager and curious to hear more about your work. So. Uh, thank you for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be with you. You bet. So you were in the World Bank within uh, about about 20 years. You've been talking about the massive fraud and, and collusion within the banking system and, of course, the World Bank in specifics. Why don't we just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, your 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 path, I guess, first here, kind of set the framework a little bit, what you've been um, through and when you decided to, to speak out, uh, Karen. Yes, well, I didn't ever not speak out. It's just relatively recently that I've gotten through uh, through the mainstream, uh, not at all through the mainstream media, through the alternative media. And that's, I think, the biggest conclusion for your listeners to take away, that there is very active censorship because the uh, issues that I'm reporting, and I'm working with a group of whistleblowers inside the World Bank, and after I was fired illegally, I've been joined by whistleblowers all over the world. So we're basically a network of whistleblowers. We're all reporting the same thing. Massive, massive, massive corruption in the financial sector. Um, so <laughs> I can tell you um, when I started out, I had no idea of the depth of the, um, of the corruption. But what we're doing is we are uncovering the cover-up. There has been a cover-up of this corruption that we're talking about, and I can describe it at great length uh, to you. Um, the, the function of our whistleblowers group is just like um, in the Wizard of Oz, Toto the dog that pulls aside the curtain. Um, the whistleblowers working collectively have exposed this corruption, and what you now have is you have um, this secret world of corruption that didn't think it was going to be exposed, just like the wizard 
who kept pointing to the big projection screen, saying, don't look at what's going on behind this um, irrelevant curtain. Look up at the screen. The screen is what the mainstream media is telling people. Uh, it's all propaganda and lies. What did you do within the World Bank, Karen, then? I was in the World Bank legal department, and so um, I was there uh, for the first 10 years. I was working as a country lawyer on various projects in the different countries I was assigned to. I started out working on Jordan and Yemen. The man who brought me into the World Bank was uh, a lawyer named Ibrahim Shihada, who before he joined the World Bank was the general counsel of OPEC. That's the organization for petroleum exporting countries. And um, after I was at the World Bank just a year, uh, an Egyptian lawyer who is now a business partner of mine um, came and asked if I wanted to meet the man who was representing the Egyptian government on the board. And I did. And I have stayed in touch with him. And I have been in touch with all of the board members. The World Bank was created in 1944. Um, at that time, there were 44 countries. At this point, the membership is 188 countries. And there are 25 resident executive directors who are on the board. And I have been working almost on a daily basis with the board. I have been cajoling the board members. I have met with them individually. Um, I have written to the countries many, many times. And um, the best thing about the World Bank is it is um, it's a knowledge bank, which is to say that um, there is a lot to be learned there. And the I think the most exciting thing um, that I and the other whistleblowers have benefited from is a very accurate, it's called a power transition model. A political scientist named Yasik Kugler came to the World Bank in 2004, and he had been developing... Um, uh, it's a computer simulation modeling. Humanity would use the World Bank structure and the IMF structure to eradicate this corruption. It provides a legal basis. And the laws that I was using, because when I started out, I, didn't, I, just, I was just doing what a lawyer inside an entity that issues bonds on the capital markets, because that's what the World Bank does. It issues $180 billion worth of bonds all over the place, denominated in all the currencies of the world. It takes the money from the people who buy those bonds, and it trades on the, on the capital markets, earns money. That's how the World Bank finances its budget. So I was trying to correct the financial information. That was my job as a lawyer inside the World Bank legal department. And, and the laws for financial disclosure are cut and dry. They are very clear. And so I have used that, those laws, as a scaffolding to clean up the corruption that we're going to be describing. So um, that's, that's one of the hardest uh, jobs that I have when I'm talking to people on the radio. They think I'm a whistleblower like, you know, Snowden or anybody else. But I'm actually not a whistleblower. I'm a sting operation. Explain that a little bit. Me and the World Bank whistleblowers are a sting operation, and we are enforcing the securities laws because when there's a cover-up and the financial statements are inaccurate, the people who own this institution have got to do something. And so yeah. I have been going to all of the governments of the world, including in the United States, I've been going to all of the state governments because they are obligated to protect the people that live in their state. So I'm not just working on the federal level in the United States, and I'm not just working in the United States, I'm working in all of the countries and all of the securities entities at the same time. Now, let's clarify a little bit more here in terms of, you, you mentioned that already a little bit in terms of how they, well, create money or, 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 or make money as well uh, with the, the issuing of bonds and everything else, but in terms of I, IMF and getting loans from IMF as a developing country, you also have to pay a member's fee to even be part of IMF, correct? So there is a, a system here that when you need to be dependent on loans by other people, you need to enter into this organization, which in most cases isn't really at that stage maybe voluntary. It's what you see as the only w way out. And then, of course, 
the World Bank and the IMF puts pressures on those countries to have them reform certain things and do certain things. So it's a way to kind of grab control over a country um, more or less in a way that haven't been thought about before, kind of overriding the political system and everything else. Would that would you say that that's a correct assessment? I would say that that is a superficial assessment. Let me tell you the real assessment. There is more wealth in the world than people know about. And when the World Bank and the IMF were created, they were given a role in that wealth as supervising that wealth. And we're using that role to take back our world and our wealth. And we're going to prevent all of the currencies of the world that are about to crash deliberately, deliberately. There is this group that um, has the network of control that you see on the capital markets. Think of an onion. And, it, you know, I've been going with the rest of the whistleblowers. We've been getting to the core of this onion. This group has not had some, um, has it's had its own ideas about what was supposed to happen. But as the coalition began to coalesce, things started happening differently from what that group is used to. So when uh, Yasek Kugler, who's the political scientist, who came to me in 2004 with the, the power transition model, he said, Karen, we have five years to prevent nuclear war in the Middle East. That was Syria. The UK Parliament refused to um, engage in that supposed war. This is the first time that we have rejected a banker's war. So you, you can start to see how this coalition is working. Um, I'll also tell you about another thing that was supposed to happen that did not happen. And that is on the 8th of October, there was supposed to be a nuclear device detonated on Charleston, so there would be massive panic, and the bankers could grab control. That didn't happen either, because the three military entities that are the strongest, the Chinese, the United States, and the Russians, understand the coalition. Don't forget, I have been writing to all of these countries on a, you know, <laughs> in, in some cases, it's a daily basis. And they know of, of the ex existence of this coalition. I've been on Russia television today three times. Yeah. And, you know, I'm starting to get through to the, the people who, who can understand what it is that's happening behind the scenes. But I have been writing to the attorneys general in the, in the United States for three years. And if you go to my website, you can see the correspondence. And I have been telling them about the formation of the coalitions, what to watch out for. Um, one of the things that happened um, that the when I first started working on this problem, I thought it was just simply the job of an in-house lawyer, although I knew that the World Bank was a special place. But I didn't I had no clue that we had massive financial corruption. You know, that was not the world that I understood. I, I, I accepted what was um, on the face of what the mainstream media was telling us. That's why when I started having problems, I went back to the mainstream media um, for the first five years. I was fired in 2007, and it was only in um, 2013 that I started getting um, more exposure on the alternative media, that I understood that it was a total waste of time to try to get something published when this network of